Good morning, YouTube. Today, I want to tell you all about my ownership experiences of having a Ferrari 458 versus my ownership experience of having a C7 Corvette. So, are you recording all of the nefarious activities? So, the first thing I want to do is tell you all about the facts. So, the Ferrari 458 was produced from 2010 all the way until 2015. This is a 2010. They produced approximately 16,000 to 18,000 Ferrari 458s. They haven't released that officially. The 458 has a 4.5 liter V8 that is a flat plane crank producing 560 horsepower and 400 foot pounds of torque. But best of all, it has a 9 thousand rpm red line so of course this means that the horsepower curve sets it up so that the horsepower increases all the way up to the peak and its peak horsepower comes very close to 9,000 rpms the torque curve on the 458 is extremely flat it produces 125 horsepowers per liter which is a very high output for this size engine the body and chassis of the ferrari are made out of aluminum so you can hear obviously the bumpers are made out of fiberglass totally different sound. It weighs about 3,400 pounds depending on your specifications. It can weigh a little bit over 3,500 or substantially below 3,400 if you have certain carbon fiber options and lighter seats and all that sort of stuff. It has a seven speed dual clutch transmission. That is the only transmission available for the 458. So the C7 was produced between 2014 and 2019. This is a 2015. They had a bunch of different options for the C7s. Obviously they had different performance options. This is the base model. So it is the Stingray. It has the 1LT package, which is a interior package. Chevrolet produced about 150,000 C7 Corvettes. So these were produced in absolute mass numbers, about 10 times more than the 458. So it has a 6.2 liter V8, which is absolutely massive. It redlines at about 6,500 RPM. So obviously the cross plane crank makes it so it doesn't rev nearly as high as the 458. It produces 460 horsepower and 460 foot-pounds of torque. That's obviously a lot of torque at a low RPM. So these cross plane cranks produce the torque at a lower range and then it kind of dwindles off as it gets higher and higher in the RPMs. The peak horsepower comes at about 6,000 RPMs. It does have a kind of different feel to it than the high revving Ferrari motor. It actually weighs almost the same. So these, depending on your model and what options you had, ranged from about 3,400 pounds all the way up to 3,600 pounds, plus or minus. Pretty much an insignificant weight difference between the two. This one has a seven speed manual transmission, which I admit is pretty badass. Shift, get in gear, uh, release the clutch, give it gas, um, noise, muscle. America. It did obviously have options available for an automatic transmission and they changed the different transmissions depending on which year you got. So the big thing is that the performance specifications of these cars depend greatly on the options for the Corvette. However, the Ferrari doesn't really have a bunch of performance options. So there are some options to remove weight and things like that, but effectively all of the 458s, unless you have the Speciale, have the exact same motor, the exact same transmission, and pretty much gonna be the same specifications of performance. Obviously, if you got the Spider, those are a bit heavier, and so they're a little bit slower, but not by a whole lot. So the zero to 60 time in the 458 is 3.4 seconds versus 3.8 seconds in the Sting race. Not a huge difference, 0.4 seconds, but that's enough that it makes a difference in the quarter mile. The quarter mile in the 458 is a 10.8 at 134 miles an hour versus a 12.4 at 124 miles an hour. So not a huge difference, you know, a little over half a second. But of course, if you were to opt for the Z06 package or ZR1 or any of those sorts of high-end packages on the Corvette, you're gonna have a much higher performance and you're gonna start, you're gonna start beating the performance of the 458 in the quarter mile. The top speed of the Ferrari is 202 miles per hour versus the Stingray only goes to 185 miles per hour. Brand new in 2010, this car sold for about $300,000, just a touch under $298,000 versus the Corvette. I don't actually know the exact numbers because I don't have the sales receipt but i believe this one optioned as is sold for about sixty five thousand dollars so that's a two hundred and thirty five thousand dollar difference which is 
pretty incredible. Also, that's about 78% difference in cost. However, I didn't buy either of these cars new, so depreciation was a major factor into making these cars affordable for me. So the Ferrari depreciated by about $143 thousand dollars making the sale price for me one hundred and fifty seven thousand dollars this means that the ferrari lost about 48 percent of its value between 2010 and when i bought it in 2019 so nine years it lost almost half its value when i bought the corvette it had lost about $27,000 in value or about 42% depreciation. And that of course means that this lost that depreciation from 2015 until 2018 when I bought it last year. So the depreciation curve on the Corvette appears to be much deeper. So yes, they're both losing already over 40% of their value and closer to 50% of value, but this is nine years old. This is only four years old. And as it sits, I'm trying to sell this car for about $35,000. So now the depreciation is much closer closer to 50% makes it kind of suck. And that means it's gonna lose a lot of its value based on the miles and based on the year. So unfortunately, that means the Corvette is depreciating a little bit faster than the Ferrari, but not by much. They're both depreciating pretty pretty rapidly, frankly. Okay, now that we've talked about some of the facts and figures about these cars, let's talk about some of the opinions. So the first thing is the sound of the cars. I personally love the sound of American V8s. I've always loved the big V8 sound and I have a, a soft spot in my heart for the sound of V8 cars. However, the high revving V8s and Ferraris just sound that little bit better. I love the sound of these high RPM Ferraris. They just sound absolutely amazing. It just sounds like a fine tuned machine. <laughs> that the, the V8s in the American cars sound bad. They sound amazing. They really do. But I just like this just a little bit more. So the sound of this Ferrari obviously now has aftermarket exhaust. It sounds a little bit better. The sound of the Corvette is actually very tame and it has the factory exhaust. <laughs> if we put an aftermarket exhaust in this car it's going to sound a lot better and once you start doing stuff like put in a bigger cam and things like that so you get that lopey idle ooh, yeah these corvettes can sound absolutely amazing so this is one of those that's totally a difference of opinion based on what you personally like all right let's take a look at the interior of the ferrari so right off the bat you can see it there's carbon fiber lining the door panel we have nice leather trim all over the place and basically all the materials in this car are very high quality high caliber materials so very little plastic is used. You've got fine Italian leather that just has an excellent feel. The touch of this just feels absolutely wonderful. Of course, you got carbon fiber everywhere, and even the carpet seems to be of reasonably high quality. You can see that the Ferrari has all the controls that you need mounted directly on the steering wheel. So you've got your turn signals right here. You've got your different driving settings, windshield wiper controls, high beams, bumpy road mode, and your engine start stop, and then your horn. All you really need to do is keep your hands on the wheel, and this is where you are focused your attention. There are controls for the stereo behind the steering wheel, so I can tur turn the volume up here, and I can change the track over here, as well as a button in the center that allows me to change different modes. So you can see the mode button here versus the changing up and down. Every button in the car has kind of a nice feel to it. They do put that soft touch coating on all the buttons, which unfortunately means in Texas that kind of turns to goo after a while, but in most places it does remain soft to touch. It has just a wonderful tactile feel to it versus even when, once the soft touch kind of fades, it still has a nice feel to the buttons. Everything's very sturdy. It has a really solid click or chunk to the button. You can hear it clicking. You know, everything just feels kind of solid. Although there is plastic, it just doesn't feel as cheap. So the air conditioning controls are actually pretty easy. I know people have complained that there's too many buttons and it looks all confusing, but once you get used to it, it's actually super easy. You basically just have one temperature gauge for each side. You have a dial that tells it where to direct the air, where you want to up or down or at your feet or whatever. And then you have one that's to do the speed of the fan. And then of course you have like, you know, AC, uh, mono basically just means you want one control to control 
control both sides and then of course different defrosters and that's it. You can see in the center we actually do have a real mechanical tachometer. We do also have shift lights here on the steering wheel which are pretty awesome. It does actually have a modern dashboard that has electronic displays so by pushing our buttons over here you can see we can change the different views so we can have different uh, gauges, whether we want oil pressure, oil temperature, etc, etc. You can see the temperature and pressure of the tires. And then over here we have the speed, which by pushing this button over here, we can then switch it to control the radio. This is where Ferrari has kind of failed and not done a really good job, is the ergonomics of the stereo are pretty terrible. So you have this little wheel which you, you spin and that changes the tracks. Uh, you can also push it up and down and left and right. We also have the volume right here. And then what's frustrating is there's two functions for each of these buttons. So you can see it has back and views. Push it quickly, it goes back. If I push and hold, it changes the view. So you can see it kind of has almost like too many settings for too few controls. Ultimately, here's the reality. You're in a Ferrari. You're not listening to the radio a whole lot. Once you get it kind of set up, that's all you really need to do is just play some songs here and there. The seats have electronic controls, so just like most seats in most cars, very simple to use forward, back, up, down. And of course, because it is a dual clutch transmission, we do have the flappy pedals right here and right here. The window switches are in the center as they are in most European cars. Then you have a few buttons for launch control for reverse and whether or not the transmission is automatic mode. We have the button to open the glove box right here, which uh, why they put it in the center is kind of strange. And finally we have one button to raise and lower the axle lifter. You can also see that because there is no transmission tunnel or any drive shaft or anything like that, the interior of the Ferrari is actually very open. So even though it is not that big of a car and the cockpit doesn't look like it's that big, it's actually quite spacious. And when you have two people in here, it doesn't feel very claustrophobic. It feels like you got a lot of space to kind of move around. And frankly, my seat is actually sitting pretty far forward. So you can see there is quite a bit of room behind the seat to put some storage if you want to put some bags or something. So unfortunately one of the downsides is that Ferrari chooses to use some crappy glue for some of their leather and ad adhesive products. You can see that the leather is starting to pull just a little bit and wrinkle a little bit. I've already had the headliner fixed where it started to sag. The dashboard is actually starting to wrinkle over here in the, in the front. Obviously this is probably due to the sun heating up the adhesive and making it degrading quality over time. So this doesn't seem to be a problem as much in cars that are in colder climates as it is for cars in Texas. So honestly, the interior of the Ferrari is just absolutely amazing. Even though it has terrible ergonomics on the radio, that's the only complaint. Everything else is very good. Quality is just excellent. There's no rattles, no, no shakes. Everything feels nice to touch and just has a great sense that is put there with purpose and with, with intentional design and quality. So now let's take a look at the interior of the Corvette. Accessing the Corvette, you push this button right here. It kind of has an electronic door release and it makes this weird sound, but it's kind of cool how you kind of like slip your hand into that little hole. Immediately you can see that there's no carbon fiber anywhere. Obviously this is more of a function of this being a low option car as carbon fiber is available in certain models. When you feel the material, it's just, it, it honestly it just feels almost like the stuff that they'd put in a pickup truck it's just not high quality it's not soft and it just doesn't feel quite as nice and of course then the seats themselves kind of have a almost vinyl feel more than it is leather even though this is a leather optioned car but you've got the transmission tunnel causing the the center console to sit much higher which does give it kind of a cool cockpit feel so you can see that all the controls surround the driver which is pretty neat but it actually makes the interior feel much smaller and kind of has a little bit more of a claustrophobic feeling about it. Unfortunately, that just kind of is not as nice. Like I do prefer the ability to have just a little bit more room and I feel like you're not so crammed into the thing. Also, you can see that there's a lot of plastic. So right here, you can see the sides of the seat are made out of plastic. Some of the trim pieces on the dashboard and things like that. So there's a lot more use of plastic all over the place versus in the Ferrari, they tended to use higher grade materials. Once you're in the car and sitting down, the seats feel just about as comfortable as the Ferrari, although maybe not quite as soft and plush. The steering wheel does not have as many controls for driving purposes on the steering wheel itself. So you've got the traditional stock for doing your turn signals and for your windshield wipers right there. You do have controls for the Bluetooth and for the stereo right here. Much more comprehensive controls, so you have the ability to move up and down and select different things. You have voice controls as well, and then of course you actually have cruise control controls. However, to change the volume and the track, it has these kind of 
plastic chintzy buttons that just they just don't feel like they should be in a Corvette. They should, they feel like they should be in a pickup truck. To me, it's like those kind of things are very frustrating because this is a high-end car and these buttons just feel cheap as hell. You can see I'm already having some wrinkling in the leather here. I've actually been looking into it and unfortunately the C7 does have some leather pulling issues just like the Ferrari. It tends to be more of on the dash and right here. And also these side panels seem to start to stretch and you can actually feel a little bit of waviness right here from setting the el my elbow down. The controls for the AC are pretty simple. You got obviously buttons to tell it which direction to go. Right here is a dial to turn the temperature. Kind of nice as the passenger has their own temperature over there. So they don't even have to reach across the console to kind of adjust their temperature. Then you've got a bunch of controls to set up the radio and do different things like that. You can see that we have a very modern display on the radio. It has a lot of cool features, Bluetooth, it synchronizes with your phone, all that stuff. The dashboard is high tech, although the tachometer is actually not a physical tachometer, which is kind of strange because the speedometer is actually a mechanical speedometer as, as well as the fuel gauge and the temperature however what's kind of cool is you can sit there and change the gauges you can change different things to have it display different things so you can see i could show all sorts of different trip and various features like that uh, it looks like i need to change my oil the computer is a little bit more comprehensive has a little bit more features in it we have different driving modes so if we go into performance driving mode it kind of changes the settings a little bit so we have g meters and acceleration trackers and all sorts of cool stuff like that so it does have some pretty interesting neat features on this car that i will say are actually pretty cool the shifting in this car feels really solid it's got a really nice transmission so shifting around has a pretty short throw it's pretty direct every once in a while it seems like when you go to one to two it does get a little bit lost getting into reverse is not too bad you just push it way over and down so it goes into reverse pretty easily but the clutch in the car feels pretty solid it grips pretty good other kind of chintzy things are like stuff like this cup holder it has this weird like plastic piece that just i don't know it falls over and, and vibrates and makes noise and stuff it drives me nuts yeah now i can get it just right in there there and even this this entire dashboard this entire console is plastic and just kind of feels cheap so one nice thing about the corvette is we do have a very large storage space so the trunk of this car is absolutely huge the downside is that you do kind of have where it's so flat and large that when you put stuff back here it slides around a lot so i would suggest getting tie down straps if you're going to be hauling stuff regularly like i actually do use this car to go get my groceries pretty frequently as you can see the trunk inside the ferrari is nowhere near the size of that as it is in the Corvette. However, it is actually reasonably large and part of it is because of the depth. So you can see you have quite a bit of vertical space. So if you stack things, it actually fits pretty well. I've actually fit two suitcases and two backpacks in here. So it does widen as it comes up near the top. And so you can start to fit stuff on the sides, which does make it actually have a reasonable amount of rooms. You're not exactly going to be fitting a bunch of groceries in here, but you can actually still use it to get groceries if you're wondering. So the driving experience is where we really start to have a divergence on the two different cars. So the C7 is an amazing car with a lot of performance, but I will say the driving experience is just not as exciting and not as interesting as it is in the Ferrari. So first of all, the steering's a little bit vague and kind of soft. I almost feel like they dialed the power steering up too high on the Corvette. So even when you put it in race mode, it does tighten down the steering it does tighten down the suspension quite a bit but still just kind of feels vague for example if you drive over stuff there's very little feedback in the steering wheel and you don't really feel it the acceleration in the car is absolutely awesome it just has so much torque that just feels like you're pulling a house down however what's fascinating is they geared this thing super tall so you can get way over 60 miles an hour in second gear you're really easy to spin the tires with that much torque at that low of an rpm so first and second gears you can spin the tires way too easily and the car could get away from you quite easily which makes it really difficult at the track so i did track this car and it does feel like when you're trying to corner you have to be way more touchy on the pedal so you can't roll onto the gas nearly as soon you have to kind of baby the gas and then wait until it's very close to totally straight before you really get on the gas otherwise I feel like the car is gonna try and kill you it's gonna spin out and you're gonna go off into the grass the long front end because you've got all the engine and stuff up here makes it set so forward visibility is actually not as good in the Corvette it's actually kind of terrible it's also really hard to tell exactly where the front of the car is when you're parking so you have to be very careful not to park into parking pylons and things like that however that means that the side visibility 
visibility is actually quite good and the rear visibility is pretty decent as well. It also does have a backup camera that does a pretty good job. However, this particular model does not have any backup sensors. The traction control on the VET is pretty good and it does kind of save your bacon when it needs to. However, it feels like it kicks in kind of slow and sluggishly. And then when it does kick in, it's like it almost just kills the car flat. It's not a very advanced traction control. It's just kind of like a sledgehammer traction control. So it's like you're, you're spinning, spinning, and then wham, it just kicks in and kills the car. And you're like, okay, I'm not gonna die anymore. So that's a good thing but it's just not very refined. Versus the Ferrari, the driving experience is absolutely epic. So it has a super well-balanced car. When you're on the track, you feel like you can almost just throttle steer it alone. It's just so balanced that as you're going through corners, you can just manage its balance with the throttle just a little bit so you can just ease on the throttle, ease off a little bit and transfer that weight back and forth. And of course, that's because of the balance on, the, on this car is so good. It also means that you can roll onto the throttle a lot sooner when you're exiting corners. So because it'll transfer the weight back into the rear of the car, it can then plant the tires really solidly and get out of that corner a lot faster. So what that means is on the track, I was able to turn much faster times, much easier than Corvette, substantially faster times. And I didn't feel like it was trying to kill me all the time. I felt very comfortable going at high speeds and pushing the car near the edge. And I felt like if it was gonna lose control or start to slide, I could regain control very easily. As you can see, the front of the car is much shorter so because you only have this trunk in the front of the car it means that your forward visibility is absolutely perfect the side visibility is also pretty good so you've got pretty large windows however once you start getting to about here and back the visibility is pretty terrible so when cars are sitting in your blind spot about here it is extremely difficult to see them because you have this big pylon right here and basically all that visibility is gone on both sides. Straight rear visibility is pretty decent so you can actually see okay out of the back although the, the rear window is pretty small and you're looking pretty far back. So that's the weird thing is you gotta remember that you're sitting about here so you're almost at the exact midpoint of the car which means that you have quite a bit of car behind you versus in the Corvette you're sitting here and you've only got this little bit behind you. It's much shorter distance, it makes backing up in this car extremely difficult. Thankfully, I've got the, the rear view camera and I also have parking sensors. It does make it a little bit easier to deal with this car when backing up. The driving modes in the 458 totally change the characteristics of the car, so it's absolutely amazing to see what it's like between sport and race and then traction control off modes. It changes the steering, it changes the throttle response, it changes the way the suspension handles, and it truly does make an absolutely huge difference in this car. It does make some difference in the Corvette, but it's just it's just not quite as much. However, it does tighten up quite a bit in race mode, so I do feel much more comfortable driving this car in race mode versus this car in race mode. It's so tight that I just don't bother with that unless I'm actually on the track or I'm out and doing a spirited drive. So I drive this car in sport mode all the time versus this car I like to drive in race mode because it's still soft in the road. It still kind of feels squishy. And that's one of the biggest things about these two as far as the driving experiences. This just feels tight. And it's not tight as in like it's painful, it's tight as in it just feels responsive. So you feel the bumps, but it doesn't hurt you. It feels like there's feedback in the steering wheel. It just feels like the car's talking to you. You feel more like one with the car versus this thing just kind of feels squishy. You know, you stab the gas and the whole car starts rocking back and forth like a Cadillac. You drive over a bump and yeah, maybe you hear it, but you can barely feel it. You certainly don't feel it in the steering wheel. It just doesn't really give you that feedback to make you feel confident that the car is going to do exactly what you want to do. So you just don't feel as one with the car as you do in the Ferrari. As far as the looks of these cars go, well, this is totally subjective, so take it for what you want. I will say, I mean, this is just, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful cars that's ever been produced. It's not 250 GTO beautiful, but it's beautiful in its own way. They both have a very aggressive styling, so they both have kind of these new modern sharp edges, and they do have really kind of cool stylish headlights, so I do like the headlights in both of them. It does give them very attractive front ends. The Corvette has the very traditional long nose, short rear, kind of American front engine style to it, and that's not to say that the Corvette looks bad in any way. It does look really good, but I feel like this is more of a beautiful car versus this is more of a punchy in the face kind of aggressive look. There's a lot of fine details in this car. They obviously have like air intakes right here and right here. And the really big thing is the back of this car just looks absolutely incredible as well. Versus I feel like the ass end of the Corvette is just kind of big. I mean, the, the bumper on it just looks huge and massive. And the actual height of this car, you can see this is, this is basically at my waist 
versus this is kind of down in my leg. You can kind of get a feel for how much taller the Corvette sits than the, the Ferrari. Keep in mind that my Ferrari has been lowered, but only about an inch and a half. The Corvette feels like it just sits so high and so large compared to the Ferrari. And I know a lot of the Corvette people in my last Corvette versus Ferrari video said how their Corvette gets just as much attention as my Ferrari, but dude, they do not. I'm sorry, there's just no way that you can say that and honestly have any sort of truth to it. It's just bullshit. The Ferrari gets ridiculous amounts of attention. When I drive that around, it is crazy. People are taking pictures, they stop where they're walking and take pictures. That just doesn't happen with the Corvette. And I think that's also a function of how common the Corvette is versus how rare the 458 is. You just don't see Ferraris every day and you pretty much can see a Corvette every day of the week here in Austin. There are tons of them, they're everywhere. That's not to say that they're bad looking cars, it's just they become normalized. So they're just not as interesting when you see it. Which actually brings up an interesting point, which is the Ferrari provides opportunity because of it being a Ferrari. I know that sounds kind of douchey in a way, but it's actually true. So what I mean by that is I've actually had business deals, I've had people approach me and talk to me about the Ferrari. There's a weird thing where there's a high concentration of Ferrari owners who are business owners, who are business savvy. There's not to say that there's not business savvy people or successful business owners who are Corvette owners as well. There's a higher concentration of them in the Ferrari market purely because of how much it costs. So in order to buy one of these, you have to have a little bit more financial oomph behind you. It's it's almost like taking the business world and distilling it down and those are the ones who are gonna be buying these cars. I know it's a very weird thing, and it's not tangible, it's totally an intangible, but there's definitely opportunities that come with buying a Ferrari that you can't put your finger on until you have one. And I will say some of that is just as simple as the friends that I've met. Certainly you're gonna meet friends if you have a Corvette, if you join Corvette groups and meet with other Corvette people and things like that. So that's not to say again that it can't happen in Corvette, but I will say I've been blown away at the opportunities that the Ferrari has provided me. So what I'm gonna tell you is, if all you care about is your bang for the buck and performance, this is your car. Go get a Corvette, it is the best car you're gonna buy for the price point bar none. It is an absolutely epic car, absolutely amazing, and I do love it dearly. And certainly at the $30,000 price point, $35,000 that I'm selling this car for, it's an absolute steal for this much performance. However, I will say the Ferrari is just absolutely incredible and the experience that comes with it is just unbeatable. You cannot say with any straight face that a Corvette is as good of an experience as is the Ferrari. It just isn't. I'm sorry, it's just not. They are amazing cars, they are not Ferraris. When you have a Ferrari and you drive a Ferrari, it's an exceptional experience that is memorable. In the wise words of Ferris Bueller's Day Off, if you have the means, I highly recommend you get one. I love driving it. It is so choice. If you have the means, I highly recommend picking one up. Well, hopefully you enjoy this and hopefully you aren't too pissed off your Corvette owner. It's okay. Try not to get too butt hurt. I understand. I talked negative about your baby. It's okay. At the same time, keep in mind, it's still a badass car. But I really love the Ferrari. This is the first car I've ever owned that I feel like I don't have any desire to sell this car ever. You would have to pay me substantially more than it's actually worth to have that car get sold. I just don't want to get rid of it. I absolutely love it. So please like, share, and subscribe. Hit that notification bell and make sure it's set to all notifications. That way you guys actually get the notifications for these videos. I do greatly appreciate when you guys do all those things. It does help out my channel. So thank you very much. Sincerely, I do appreciate it. And I'm not trying to sit there and shit on you guys who own Corvettes. They are great cars. You should be proud that you own a Corvette and I'm sure most of you are. Take it easy. Take it easy. Don't jump off a cliff. It's okay. We have a lot of car stuff coming your way so please stay tuned. It's gonna be sweet.